So um, this is the Tiny TED Talks, and it's sort of uh, a grown-up show and tell, perhaps, but everybody's got something that they're passionate about, and Shirley has sailed a lot. And so this is Shirley Cannon, and this is... She's starting here. Blue water sailing. <clears throat> that means <clears throat> offshore, out of sight of land, where the water is so blue sometimes you can there's nothing like that color. It's fathomless. You don't want to jump overboard at that point. <clears throat> and um, I learned to sail in Alaska on a big boat, a 47-foot cutter rig sloop. That's pretty much like from here to the front door. Um, with a crew of all women. And my skipper was a teacher for the University of Alaska and I was uh, teaching an introduction to sailing course. Had four people shy to so, uh, show up and had room for one more and invited me to come along and learn how to sail. And what I learned more than anything else was the language. What is, okay, I wrote them down here just, just before I came here today. What is it? the bow, the stern, the rail, the stanchions, the lifelines, the bowsprit, the forestay, the shrouds, on deck, below deck, uh, inboard, outboard, overboard, <laughs> <laughs> cockpit, bridge deck, companionway, below, settee, galley, Nav station, four peak bunk. <laughs> I like the four peak bunk. I finally say it a little bit. And you know, those are just some of the language that when you are out there in the middle of the ocean, okay, here's a start with a story. Middle of the channel between Oahu and Kauai pitch dark, we have a jib with a boom that broke in the middle of the night, and crack! And now, here's this sail flapping around with a baseball bat on the end of it, and he says, I'll take care of it. And now I'm standing in the companionway watching, 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 to see what can I do to help. He turns to me and says, get me the green-handled pliers. I know what he means. Where are they? And he says, below, starboard, settee, forward, and inboard. Okay, below, starboard, forward, inboard. Now the trick is, they need to be there. He didn't put them anyplace. And I got them and I came back up and gave them to him. And we solved this emergency. Uh, in, in a really positive way. And at the end of that voyage, we were hugging each other and saying, wow, 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 wasn't that good? And another boat that came on the same crossing, tied up in Nawili Wili Kauai, she got off with her bag and kept walking and never turned back and looked. What is the difference? I claim that difference was communication. Knowing what he said and knowing where he meant is as a say as crew as crew is the most important thing to be able to communicate so what does it take to uh, cross the ocean on a big boat know your boat if you go on a boat any boat anytime know how to start and stop the engine raise and lower the sails and use the radio. Every ocean boat has a radio. And all, if all you need to do is to turn it on, and it on, automatically comes to channel 16, which is line of sight radio around you. That's the first thing you need to know. There's ham radio, and there's a whole bunch of other things. But that's the first thing you need to know. Absolutely. 
first thing, hello, could I please see, you know, how to start and stop the engine, how to raise and lower the sails, how to use the radio. Now know your skipper, that's a little tricky. If some guy says to you, oh, right, sweetheart, come with me, we'll, I'll sail you over to Hawaii. You just go below and watch some videos and I'll wake you up when we get there. She's a bigger fool than he is if she buys that because what's going to happen if she wakes up at some point and she's the only one on board? <laughs> it happens. Easily. Somebody could fall overboard. Easily. Really. Or worst of all, you're in a, st okay, the worst of every woman's nightmare. They were in a hurricane, delivering from Tahiti to the mainland. And um, she, they changing watches. And um, they changed, and she went below and crashed into the, bur into the bunk. And she remembers hearing a loud noise and a crash or something, and woke up she thought the next morning turned out to be a day later and the boat is half full of water and she staggers out onto on, and her head is gashed and full of dried blood okay she's no longer bleeding staggers out onto deck and there is nothing there no sails no mast no boom no fiancé in that case. His little D-ring on the pedestal is opened. Whatever way it came over and did that to them, wiped him and everything else out. And it happens in the middle of the ocean. Now, as the <clears throat> only one on board, you better know or think you know how to deal with this. It took her 43 days to, well, fortunately, one of the tanks still had fresh water. That, that saved her. And, and she figured out how to point, how to steer the boat toward Hawaii. And 40 some days later, you know, kind of drifted into Hilo <laughs> and some fishermen. Wow. fishermen came out and said, did somebody die? And she goes, mm -mm, was all she could do. However, her name was Tamara. I don't remember anything else. Red right, Sky and Morning was the book. Right. Okay. And I think she also had part of the jib sheet. Yes, she had something that she survived into a sail. Yeah. Yeah, to be able to point. Wow. Yeah, wow. Well. <laughs> well, you know, you... You don't go out there unless you know or think you know. Maybe that's the, that's the key. You think you know. You know, when I came on board, um, I don't know how to change the filter on the oil filter on the engine. But every time my husband did it, I was over there, perched over the hatch, watching and thinking, okay, you know, if I'm out there by myself, and the engine stops. One of the possibilities is that the oil filter needs to be changed, and so now I can do that. Navigation. Oh, shit. Nowadays, we have a GPS. No problem, right? <laughs> Until a great big wave comes on board and wipes out every electronic you have on board. The, um, the, Maritime academies nowadays. My sweet husband is a graduate of California Maritime Academy, class of deck 56. And they learned celestial navigation. He taught classes in a sextant, <coughs> a book of little teeny tiny numbers, and then how to, I took this class several times, <laughs> um, Point at the sparkly water, sparkly water. Lift it up and find, okay, 
Now we're talking about the sun, not a star. Bring it down to the and check your watch for exactly what time did you bring that down and have a number on your sextant and the time on your watch. That's what a GPS does, is the whatever it is. The marine weather forecast. Ah, yes. Important to know the weather that's ahead. Yeah. It's also important to go out into the cockpit and look at the horizon and see, is it calm or is it rough and windy? Because he's a, he is a, um, um, what are you, a meteorologist. And on our voyages across, he would spend hours with radios and, and the marine weather forecasts and personally, and uh, the biggest storm we were ever in was when I stepped at, oh, our, okay, you have a steering mechanism. It can be automatic and electronic, or it can be a wind vane, is what we had most of the time. And that works fine as long as the wind is pushing you in this direction. If the wind changes, it also changes. So it's important to have a, a compass below to know if you're still going in the right direction. But, um, he, okay, I stepped out and looked around and said, darling, remember when it's important to, when you, to take a reef in the main when you first think about it? I think we should, he stepped out, oh yes, the wind has come up. And it was one of the worst, not a storm, it was a gale. It was, one, it was one of the worst wind situations we were ever in. Um, provisioning. Ah, now if you're going to sea for 20 or 30, our longest crossing was 34 days from Mazatlan, Mexico to Hilo. Now, Mazatlan, if you look north, it's like Oklahoma or something in the, in the U.S. That, that west, east coast of the North America just keeps moving, moving, moving. And by the time you get to Mazatlan, which is on the, on the uh, main coast of Mexico, north of it is past Nevada, it's in there somewhere. 34 days. But it was easy wind all the way. And at some point, I'm saying to him, I could walk to Mexico, I could walk to Hawaii faster than this boat is going. Turn on the engine. We arrived in Hilo with 40 gallons of fuel in our. <clears throat> <laughs> However, provisions. So, uh, so when you are ready to stow, always ready to stow more than you need, go to a store and you find something you like, buy all of them. Bring them home and put them in. Sometimes um, in Mexico I had to buy meat, chickens or whatever, and can them, which I had the glass jars to do that with. And then I found, um, um, what do you call it, suits that you dive with, skin suits. Suits. Wetsuits. 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 All wetsuits at the thrift shop. Cut them up and put them around the the glass jars and stow them in the bilge. Always a good idea to put glass way below deck. Green things. Now our first crossing from Lahaina, Maui to Victoria um, was on a delivery on someone else's boat. I had no chance to provision, but uh, we ate a can of something on a can of something, most of the way. We ended up with constipation and overweight, gained weight. Over the years, I figured out how to do that. And in our last crossing from Mexico back to, um, I would go down to the Mercado and buy 
anything green, green onions, green leaves, green, not lightweight green, but dark green things. Bring them back to the boat and I had created a dryer. So it, it, it was a strap that went from the mast down four of them and, and three squares of and black cloth and I would chop these all up and lay them in there and in two or three days in that kind of heat they were perfectly dry. Now one of the times, only one, when I pulled them out they were layered in something black and something that looked like plastic. So even though I bought these greens, I brought them back to the boat, I put them in three, have three five gallon buckets. The first one has water and um, I don't know. bleach, bleach, water and bleach. Rinse, rinse into the dryer. Even after that, they were layered in something black that you would not want to eat. So you have to, you have to watch for that. A small store of what you like to eat. That's a good way to provision. Now, um, so how to get, how to actually do this is that you become a sea creature. The minute you cast offshore, if you are thinking about how many days until I get to where we're going, it's not going to be pleasant. But our approach was, oh darling, can I get something for you? Would you, would you like some more pillows? How about something to eat? You know, anything at all. To make it this pleasant, enjoy sailing. Be thankful, be, be grateful. Be, you'll never get to do this again. This is part of it. Become a sea creature. Now, everybody gets seasick the first two or three days. Everybody. If you've been ashore for a while. Now, my last crossing from Hawaii back to Alaska, they had, my, the other three, had been on board for a month from St. Thomas through the canal. Picked me up in Hawaii. And the first three days, I was miserable. I was eating crackers. I was trying to steer the boat. I was miserable. And finally, the guy at the gate said, take these dramamine. We all take them, and it works. So in trying to swallow them, I gagged, went over the rail, and threw up. And then I felt better. <laughs> <laughs> and then we just went on, and everything was fine. He said, shall we drink? No, I feel fine now. <laughs> Now, also, when you set out across the great ocean, be ready to die. When we set out, we would call our children, you know, let them all know that we're making this crossing, we love them, pay all of our bills, nothing, no, no more connection to shore. We are ready to die. Now, when my husband told my mother this, <laughs> She said, <clears throat> well, that's okay for you to say now, but what if you change your mind at the last minute? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what she said, but I heard her say, that's okay for you, but you don't have to take my daughter with you. <laughs> or something like that. Um, okay, a successful voyage, according to me, is one where, oh gosh, there's five points. Anything that breaks is um, fixed or jury rigged. That means you make it kind of work until you can fix it. Anything that goes overboard <coughs> is rescued or we didn't need it. Um, everybody arrives at our destination together. Nobody jumps ship. Our boat touches only water. We don't run into anything. And we all want to do this again. 
Now that's a successful voyage. <laughs> My husband has made fun of that, but it's okay. Now, your voyage has a destination, but the purpose is to enjoy the voyage. Life is like that. Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Question and answer. Yeah, question and answer. Any questions? Any questions? I, I have a question. I, I missed the first part of your talk, so I'd like to. I'm glad it's been videotaped. Were you ever dismasted? Or? Oh, the weirdest thing of all. After all of our literally thousands of miles at sea, we dismasted in Santa Cruz Harbor, <laughs> leaving the dock. Really? Yes. Oh, amazing. He was deckhand, I'm at the helm. And as he pushes us off, I said, I would do it differently than that. And we merely moved over, and the wind was pushing us, and the boat in front of us had a big boom, and it dismasted it. <laughs> our mizzen. Oh, at least it wasn't your being. <laughs> right. But, however, the buyers on board still bought the boat. Oh, <laughs> 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 they did. Because of the way we handled that. Cool. Right. Or, when you, since you're doing open ocean sailing, how important is it to have an ALS system on board? An ALS system, the automatic locator. No. You don't have. You don't. No. Our one. our sailing, our crossings were twenty some years ago. Oh, so it was before they. We had the, and the, the first two or three or more didn't have GPS. He was out there taking sights and taught me how to take <coughs> sights, and it was interesting. We would do them side by side, and for a, for a few days, or for quite a while, I was always 15 miles off with our calculations. And then finally, he realized that he had a calculator for one of the sets of numbers that he had set up incorrectly. And I was right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we're letting forget that. Actually, I don't tell the story, but he does. But he loves to tell that story. Well, my, any other questions? Did you ever have a, a desalinator on board? Or? Oh, yes. Yeah. Our last boat had a water maker. Right on. Yeah. And solar panels. Cool. That, that flipped up and then flipped down along the lifelines in rough weather. It was, it was great, although that last voyage on our second boat, not the little boat, I'm sorry, folks, to reveal with you, it was the cruise from hell. Mm -hmm. The boat caught on fire. <laughs> that is, this wonderful little electric fan shorted out and flames reach and dripping plastic and fortunate, fortunately we were on board in a harbor and, and put it out. He got malaria in Mexico. That's a try. I got uh, injured, tossed across the board, <laughs> twice, twice. <laughs> um, let's see, what else happened? Oh, our nice new water tanks, I pumped some water up there and it's full of little half-inch, semi-translucent, you know, fallopian, fallop, fallopian tubes. <laughs> little tubes with flowers on the end of each. That was the kind of the beginning, the, the, actually the fire was the beginning of the end of my cruising life when we got to Hawaii and they said, how would you like to come ashore and be the minister of our church? And I said, okay. Actually, I said to Chuck, Chuck, it's up to you. Do you really want to do this? And he said, no. What? How can you say that? Ever since I've known you, you have wanted to be interim at Holy Innocent, a fat cat church in Lahaina. And the owner of the coffee comes over and says, Chuck, what's the matter, buddy? It was a yes or no question, and I got it wrong. <laughs> and the guy says, you had a 50-50 chance of getting it right. <laughs> Aww, well, thank you. Okay.